in our historical study on Rubens' life in Italy between 1600 and 1608. Um, Rubens moved to Italy from Antwerp in Belgium as a young artist and he just went there to study um, the Renaissance art and the classical masters and stuff. And in this time period he worked as a court painter and just traveled around and my project was looking at which which Titian paintings he would have seen when he was in Italy. And then we used digital mapping software to map these locations and map the paintings in there. And the reason why we studied these two artists is that Rubens and Titian is a connection that's widely recognized in the art historical community, and it's, but it's mostly studied at a later point in Rubens' career um, when he specifically became very interested in Titian's work and actually collected a lot of his paintings. Um, so we picked this time period because it's a much earlier phase in his career. We're just sort of studying um, which paintings he would have seen and how that could have influenced him. And then the broader goal of this project is just to see how digital technology can be used in art history research. It's sort of a new field for art history. And so we experimented with ArcGIS software and we're thinking about using a program that Harvard created called World Map. Um, it's still a work in progress for our project, but that's basically it. Hi, I'm Ian Sanagata, and this is my presentation on stars and space. In the Milky Way, we don't know a lot of the distances to a lot of the stars out there. So my study is dedicated to finding those distances and classifying the stars. We know that our sun is a G2 V star. That's a main sequence G2 star. The sequence of stars goes from hot to cold, starting with O, B, A, F, G, going to K and M, being the coldest. Now my study dedicated itself to finding the distance. How do we do that? We use the infrared and spectroscopy. Generally, each star has a different flux they give off. And these little divots you see here are um, spectroscopic features for each element. For example, this right here means that a star has hydrogen in it at 1.74 microns. So what I do is I take the area under this continuum and it gives us a numerical value that we can be used to compare and classify the star. From this classification, we can get the distance to the star, and voila, we know the distance to that star and map the magnetic field of the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so the general principle behind my work is using a uh, technique called surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And essentially what happens is by putting a molecule near a uh, nanite-structured metal surface, we can actually increase our sensitivity to the vibrational modes of that molecule and use it as sort of a identification tool of different vibrational modes and how they interact with one another. So, for example, my particular project has been working with hemoglobin and the red blood cell, which is the erythrocyte. Um, at first we were just looking at the erythrocyte itself, but we determined by process of elimination that in the entire spectrum was actually dominated by hemoglobin, and even more than that, the heme subgroup, or ligand, of that hemoglobin protein. Because of that, we were looking to identify certain bands which were only available from the SIRS uh, spectrum. And as a result of that, we were able to basically identify these bands in process of elimination by saying it's not part of the erythrocyte, it's not part of the protein. And now, sort of where we're going from here is one of the things we've noticed is by studying hematin, which is a byproduct of malaria's digestive cycle, we've actually been able to identify skeletal modes specific to porphyrin rings. Uh, since 1867, uh, malaria has been combated by a drug called chloroquine, which is essentially an anti-inhibitor uh, for the dimerization of hematin. It's a beta hematin, which is a more digestible substrate for the uh, actual red blood cell, uh, parasite. However, the binding site for chloroquine is still unknown. By looking at the shifts in hematin, we hope to find the actual binding site and better and further our understanding of malaria and eventually drug resistant malaria. Alright, so essentially what we were trying to do here is um, isolate certain um, muscarinic acetylcholine receptor subtypes that are thought to um, modulate the uh, pathways involved in cocaine's behavioral effects. So um, in order to do that, what we did was train the mice to discriminate the behavioral effects of cocaine versus saline in an opera chamber. Um, we, you know, when they respond correctly, they get rewards, and essentially once they get their training down and they're able to test, we do a number of different things with them. The first thing we do is uh, train them on kind of a battery of cocaine doses to produce a sort of uh, drug 
a dose effect curve like one of these. It's kind of a sigmoidal thing. We see kind of lesser um, responding or lesser cocaine-like responding on the lower end of things. And then once you get to the higher dose of cocaine, uh, it really feels like cocaine, right? So um, that's kind of our baseline. That uh, dose effect curve serves kind of the baseline for us to work from. And then once we kind of have that going, what we look to do is uh, attempt to modulate the, that pathway and attenuate those behavioral effects through um, muscarinic uh, ligands, which essentially um, the first portion of this project was looking at the M1 and M4 receptor subtypes and attempting to agonize those receptors in hopes of essentially boosting endogenous acetylcholine. Those are like those two were the subtypes were kind of what we're most interested in. And then the second portion, kind of the control portion, which is what I worked on most of the summer, was to look at the M2 receptor subtype, uh, which essentially is kind of an autoreceptor. It's um, and it has inhibitory effects on the uh, cholinergic system. And we're looking to dampen those inhibitory effects and prove essentially or verify that that receptor is not involved in the same attenuated processes that M1 and M4 are involved in. So, what I did this summer mostly was looking at that M2 receptor and looking at um, antagonizing its actions. And what we see when we antagonize um, those that receptor is kind of that same attenuated effect because you're kind of taking they're taking off that break-like effect of the M2 receptor. And kind of in the intermediate doses of these two drugs that we tested, methoctramine and Nicoray, you see um, essentially the same sort of attenuative effect you would see when agonizing M1 or M4. Um, and then what's kind of in the process now is we're looking at M2 um, receptor subtype knockout mice, essentially mice that don't have that receptor. And we are attempting to um, verify that that same attenuative effect is not seen in those mice because they don't have a receptor. So that's kind of where we're going right now. We, uh, yeah, we're looking basically at the control portion of isolating the two receptors that we're most interested in. Okay, so um, this summer I was actually at the U um, working in Dr. Hansen's lab. And my research was trying to understand how LSF affects the cell cycle from progressing from G2 into mitosis. So this drug was discovered that actually in hepatocellular carcinoma, the cells actually die. You kind of like treat the cells. When you treat the cells, they kind of like, you know, die. So the lab was interested in studying how this might be working in the cell cycle, how inhibition of this transcription factor might be affecting other proteins in the cell cycle, like our kinase B. So um, I kind of treated the cells. I worked with two different cell lines, one that's considered to be a normal cell line and another one that's um, a cancer cell line that you can actually work with in the lab. So I had to synchronize the cells so I can get them all at the G2M level of the cell cycle. So um, I did this in the normal cell lines by stabbing them and releasing them. And in the QGY cells, I inhibited them with mimosin so you can get them in G1, I guess. And then after that, the cells were treated with this molecule, which is the molecule that's been shown to help reduce the progression of hepatocellular cellular carcinoma. And then you harvest the cells for flow cytometry and protein immunoglobulin. And when the cells are, for the protein immunoglobulin, in the cells that were treated with the molecule, you see a low level of expression of the allokinase B. So that's kind of like an intriguing finding. It might be a potential pathway that this um, Fiki one drug might be acting on. My hero of the summer was about a condition called aphasia. And this is a condition characterized by a language impairment, by a stroke or head injury. And the person who this happens to loses the ability to sometimes speak. They completely forget and have to relearn a language, or they could specifically not remember certain words. And the aphasia lab at Boston University has a great program for aphasia research and treatment. But the only problem is a lot of the times the patients that they do have don't have enough money for treatment from their insurance companies. And so my professor had the idea of creating an iPad app as an alternative for treatment. 
And so this summer took all of her treatment types and converted them into a way that you could actually have a clinician-free treatment on an iPad. So now these patients can take an iPad home and do all the treatment that they would have gotten at Boston University, but at home, and it's a lot less cost to them, and a lot of the patients are getting better.